Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, major concern for the world. Help to wake up the world to this diabolical church that we call Christian, of all things. This uh, this particular article comes from Main, uh, excuse me, Mail Online World News. This is www.dailymail.co.uk. Mail Online World News. This was uh, given to me by one of my listeners. A submission from one of the listeners. I thank you very much for that. I don't have permission to acknowledge them uh, by name, but nonetheless, I uh, depend upon my listeners to keep me abreast of what's going on uh, in addition to my own research. But this happens to do with the pedophile priest pandemic. It's entitled, Catholic Sex Scandal as Uncovered Reporter Films Priests at Gay Clubs and Having Casual Flings. This is by Nick Pisa, and it broke, the story broke, Uh, on Saturday, the 24th of July, 2010. The article reads thus, A gay priest sex scandal has rocked the Catholic Church in Italy today after a weekly news magazine released details of a shock uh, investigation it had carried out. Using hidden cameras, a journalist from Panorama magazine, owned by Italian Prime Minister and media baron Silvia Berlusconi, of all people, I will just add, filmed three priests as they attended gay night spots and had casual sex. Today, there was no immediate comment from the Italian Bishops' Conference and the Vatican, which has been rocked by a series of sex scandals involving pedophile priests since the start of the year. Uh, That's an understatement. Uh, That might... uh, (laughs) That might apply to Italy. Italy's been pretty tight-lipped about the... uh, the long history of priest sexual improprieties, and particularly pedophilia. But the world is rocked by global epidemic. I call it a pandemic of out-of-control Roman Catholic priests preying on innocent young boys. And uh, this article includes photographs taken from this video showing a priest whose face is pixelated so you can't uh, see his identity, but in a um, stage of undress talking to someone also uh, partially unclothed. And the caption under the the photograph reads, uh, Caught in the act, a priest still wearing his dog collar approaches a gay accomplice of the undercover reporter as their casual affairs caught on camera in the Italian magazine Panorama's footage. And it's a, and then another picture of the same priest in his fully frocked uh, priestly garb uh, with a caption underneath, the same priest later prepares to read Mass. So... Uh, after recently soiling his hands in a in a homosexual dalliance, then he's preparing himself to serve communion <laughs> to the Roman Catholic laity. This is a a preview of the Pan- Panorama article sent out by mail last night. Added that video footage from the investigation would be made available. The article describes how the reporter was assisting a gay accomplice as they gate crashed. A wild nights, uh, the wild nights of a number of priests in Rome who live a surprising double life. In the interview, Panorama added, quote, By day they are regular priests, complete with dog collar, but at night it's off with the cassock as they take their place as perfectly integrated members of the Italian capital's gay scene. Panorama describes its investigation as deeply disturbing as it detailed how three priests, two Italians and a Frenchman, happily took part in gay events and had casual sex. The Catholic Church forbids priests to have sex, and homosexuality is also seen as a sin. In 2008, the Vatican issued guidelines which said that 
any would-be trainees should not join if they had deep-seated homosexual tendencies. Is one In one part of the investigation, Panorama said that one priest named as Carlo willingly put on his cassock to have sex with the reporter's gay accomplice, adding, quote, all of which was filmed by the hidden camera, unquote. The magazine also described how they had attended a mass which was celebrated by Carlo. In its preview, Panorama insisted that it had carried out through its uh, checks and established uh, through its checks and established that all three priests were bona fide, but would not reveal their real names or any other details. Panorama editor uh, Giorgio Mule said, quote, "This was a two-week investigation." and was not aimed at creating a scandal, but showing that a certain section of the clergy behaves very differently. Yes, a certain section. Um, I won't go into a full dissertation, but the secret to understanding the cause of the pedophile priest pandemic in this world is found in the second commandment, forbidding idolatry, and then Romans chapter 1. A thorough, prayerful, and obedient understanding of that commandment and Romans chapter 1 identifies the cause of priest pedophilia in the world. And not until Rome purges itself of all forms of idolatry will the scourge of pedophilia ever be removed from the Roman Catholic Church. Wherever you find idolatry, you will find sodomy. And everywhere you find sodomy, you will find idolatry. Cause and effect relationship, a divine recompense for committing that error which most provokes God to anger. Idolatry, reducing him to a man-made image through which man erroneously thinks God is worshipped. It's filthy, it's abominable, and no spiritual life can result. Likewise is sodomy. God's punishment is just. Now, returning to the book Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart, we were talking last week Uh, before the end of the program on Friday, about the Holy Office of the Inquisition, now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, as Daryl Eberhardt alluded to previously at the end of the broadcast uh, of Greg Szymanski's Investigative Journal. It's still up and running, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, And it still serves the same purpose today that it ever did, the extirpation of heretics and the preservation of the teachings and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which has been rather lax uh, on its uh, pedophile priest program, but uh, uh, Rome doesn't like to admit her errors. But anyway, we were talking about Joseph Ratzinger, who headed up, for 25 years, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now he's Pope. And it says for over two decades, until 2005, that congregation was headed up by Bavarian-born Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. It may surprise you, dear reader, but the present Pope was once called the Great Inquisitor and the pit bull of the Inquisition by Jesuits. And Mr. Dostoevsky, I'm sure, would agree. In fact, Ratzinger is a Jesuit-picked cardinal from Bavaria, Germany. He said, we present proof of this assertion below. Prior to becoming Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger was appointed professor of the highly prestigious theology department at the University of Tübingen in Germany, on the strong recommendation of Jesuit Hans Kung, who at the time was dean of the department. 
Interestingly, we shall see later, Bavaria was home to the Jesuit founder of the revolutionary order called the Illuminati. And it is therefore not surprising that Bavaria would later become the beating heart of Hitler's Nazi revolution. Pope Benedict XVI is intensely Bavarian and was educated at colleges in Bavaria, most of which were founded and controlled by the Jesuits. So Benedict the Sixteenth can be could be uh, regarded as a Jesuit, or at least Jesuit trained, and with 25 years of extensive experience as a prefect uh, of, at the Holy Office of the Inquisition, uh, he's now Pope, and as Pope, has arrogated to himself diplomatic immunity. And part of that was a strategy to avoid being named in numerous lawsuits around the country as being a responsible party uh, as prefect of the Congregation of the, Doctor, of the Doctrine of the Faith, a responsible party in the global pedophile priest pandemic. But now he's hands off because he sits on the throne of God. Now, it says, in 1252, the then Pope made a decree stipulating the exact details of how the prisoners of the Inquisition were to be tortured, including children from age 12 and upwards. More than 50 million members of the human families estimated to have been slaughtered under the sanction of the Roman Catholic Church. That is a quote from John Dowling in his History of Rome, Book 8. Now, John Dowling and this 50 million figure is very often repeated. And not being a, a historian myself, not having personally investigated this, I can't with a great deal of authority challenge that 50 million figure. But I maintain that those figures are extremely conservative based on the fact they don't take into account the number of lives lost in all the papal proxy wars that have taken place over the over the course of history. And uh, the number would be incalculable. Those people who have lost their lives as a direct and indirect result of papal and particularly Jesuit influence in the fomentation of wars now, continuing, it says, for nearly six centuries, as a matter of fact, one researcher uh, whom I mention uh, occasionally on the broadcast, Richard Bennett from www.bereanbeacon.org, uh, says that it, it was 605 years, to be precise. It says, for nearly six centuries, writes Peter DeRosa in the book entitled Vicar of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy, not one of the 80 popes from the 13th century to the 19th said a single word against the diabolical uh, machinery of the Inquisition. Rather, they each added their own cruel touch to the awful machinery of death. If the objection be raised that Catholics, too, have been killed by Rome, then we say, sure, for Rome will wade through the blood of Roman Catholics to get to the heretics. Never forget this fact, says author P.D. Stewart. And that is uh, an admonition that should be heard loud and clear in this Protestant country, a, a country from stem to stern regarded as heretical by the papacy, both its form of government and its laws and its constitution and its teachings uh, from the pulpits of the churches. Both Catholics and Protestants are regarded as heretics in this country. Uh, the Catholics would be regarded by the papacy, having lived in this uh, liberal society under, a, under a, uh, what, the, what Rome considers a de jure, or, or excuse me, a de facto government, and under compromised teaching... Remember, Catholicism in this country is, is hardly any resemblance to Catholicism in Catholic countries uh, because it has to live in, in peace and existence uh, with, with Bible-believing Protestants in this country. 
uh, without raising the ire, uh, so to speak, uh, of Protestants. And because of that liberal attitude, and their love for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, and all the other constitutional liberties of this country are regarded by Rome as schismatics and liberals. Okay? And I repeat that Rome never hesitates to wade through the blood of Roman Catholics to get to the heretics. And we must be mindful of this. The author says, never forget this fact. And uh, that goes for Catholics as well as Protestants in this country. You know, I'm often accused of reciting all this diabolical history of the Roman Catholic Church of being a Catholic basher. But the reality is that much of what I say on this program and on amateur radio and all my other communications, both email and, and, and chat rooms, is as much for the benefit of Catholics in this country as it is for Protestants. We have to wake up to the reality of what Rome really is. And this is uh, part of that effort, is to read this book by P.D. Stewart, Code Word Barbalon. Now, Dr. Paul Collins, a Catholic priest and Harvard graduate, makes the following comment about this Jesuit monstrosity called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Quote, The Holy Office may have changed its name, but the ideology underpinning it has survived. It has certainly not changed its methods. And he adds, this body has no place in the contemporary church. It is irreformable and therefore should be abolished, unquote. That from a Roman Catholic uh, priest. It is irreformable and therefore should be abolished. And author Michael Bajant writes that for 25 years, Ratzinger was the power behind the congregation, where he served unwaveringly as the enforcer of Catholic dogma and moral theology. Now he himself exercising the papal chair. According to Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, one is not free to choose truth unless that truth means acting in accordance with the Church's, the Roman Catholic Church's teachings. To do otherwise, says Benedict, is to embrace error. So what does that mean if you do not follow the Roman Catholic Church's teachings? You are embracing error. You are heretical. That from the mouth of Rome's pit bull, the enforcer, the inquisitor of 25 years, you are embracing error if you don't follow the Roman Catholic Church's teachings. Thus we see that despite its reorganization and new name, the congregation still has the same role to protect and advocate Catholic teaching on matters of faith and morals and to search out and punish those who it considers offenders. Article 48 of the Apostolic Constitution on the Roman Curia, Pastor Bonus is the title of it, promulgated by Pope John Paul II on June 28, 1988, states, quote, The duty proper to the congregation of the doctrine of the faith is to promote and safeguard the doctrine on the faith and morals throughout the Catholic world. For this reason, everything which in any way touches such matters falls within its competence. Unquote. So that means anything that touches doctrine or faith or morals of the Roman Catholic Church falls within the purview, the jurisdiction of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. And had he been extremely specific, he would have included all Protestants or anyone that disagrees with Roman Catholic dogma and its teaching uh, comes under the purview of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Rome does not just police her own. The whole object of the Inquisition was to extirpate and annihilate Protestants, heretics, anybody 
who refused the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the author is going to touch on the Jesuit mission. What is the mission of the Jesuit order? Despite the apparent rigidity implied in the Jesuit hierarchical structure, the order has always been characterized by its great flexibility and a capacity for adaptation to suit whatever distant lands, changes in the times or adverse situations in which they were to operate. To better equip them in this task, the following secret instructions is given to all the rank of the order. Now, this is from the secret instructions, which we've talked about previously. Quote, should anyone ask on what errand the good fathers, that is the Jesuits, have come, they are to make answer that their, quote, sole object is the salvation of souls, unquote. Quoting further, they are to be careful to maintain a humble and submissive deportment. They are to pay frequent visit to the hospital and secret chamber and the prisons. They are to make great show of charity. These good deeds will not lose their reward. Men will begin to speak of them and say, What a humble, pious, charitable order of men these fathers of the Society of Jesus are. Thus the newcomers will receive the respect and reverence of the best and most eminent in their neighborhood. Unquote. You see how they ingratiate themselves to the to the uh, local populations? Outward signs of piety and charity, but in secret they work the overthrow of Protestant and heretical governments and kings and rulers. That's their purpose. That's their mission. For the ultimate purpose and goal of raising the papacy to global supremacy. A new world order. Now the author continues, they are further told to say, quote, that their vow is one of poverty, that they have nothing to do with politics or wealth, their sole object being to put down heretics, unquote. But William Russell reminds us that the Jesuits are in fact, quote, chosen soldiers under the command of a general, and they are required to attend to the transactions of the great men of the world, to study the dispositions of persons in power, and to cultivate their friendship, unquote. Ignatius, who formed the Jesuit order, called his order, quote, the militia of Christ, unquote. But in fact, they are the Pope's militia. The famous Jesuit general Michael Angelo Tamburini once boasted in 1720 to the Duke of Bresca, uh, Bresic, quote, See my grace, from this room I govern not only Paris but China, not only China but the whole world without anyone knowing how it is managed, unquote. Is indeed the most powerful man in the world, the Jesuit general. And we'll talk more about it in this marvelous book by P.D. Stewart, Code Word Barbalon. When we return from the break, you're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. 
If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe, so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now, this extraordinary quote from Jesuit General Michelangelo Tamburini in 1720, he said to the Duke of Brissac, See, my grace, from this room I govern not only Paris, but China. Not only China, but the whole world, without anyone knowing how it is managed. He is the most powerful man in the world. We're looking for a new world order. It was established a long time ago. What we're seeing is just a progression of that new world order. A time in which all pretense can be thrown off. And it can be publicly talked about. Right now, it's still secret, but it's coming out in the open. And it's it's possible now to see what the New World Order is, how it's unfolding, and how it manifests itself in the world. And P.D. Stewart's got a good eyeball on it, and I'm glad to be reading this book on on the program. It it continues talking about the Jesuit general. It says, speaking of its immense power, Jesuit general Muto uh, uh, Vitelski in 1640 vaunted, quote, The members of the society are disposed in every corner of the world and divided into as many nations and kingdoms as the earth has limits. Divisions, and among so many different geniuses, no controversy, no contention, nothing which gives you a hint to perceive that they have more than one. They have 
it says the same aim, same conduct, same vow, which like a conjugal knot has tied them together. At the least sign, one man, the Jesuit general, turns and returns the entire society and shapes the revolution of so large a body, unquote. They're all over the world, and they're governed by one man. John F. Kennedy outed them in his secret society speech. He called it a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. Anyone with any knowledge of the English language knows that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. A monolithic conspiracy is an oxymoron, but it accurately describes the Jesuit order. And as we read further, you'll understand the meaning that John F. Kennedy meant to convey by purposely using an oxymoron that fits the Jesuit order and only the Jesuit order. It says, Dr. Wiley gives us an insight, an insight into the breadth of his papal militia and gives means by which the general governs all. Quote, among the ranks of the Jesuits, one will find the day laborer, the tradesman, the opulent banker, the shoemaker and the porter, the stolic cleric, the dignitary and the learned professor, the cowled mendicant and all grades of literary men, from the philosopher, the mathematician, the historian, to the schoolmaster, the reporter on the provincial newspaper, all professions are controlled in the society. Marshaled and in continual attendant before their chief stand a host, so large in number and so various in gifts, that working together there is perhaps few things they cannot achieve. And the word of the general, at the word of the general they go, and at his word they come, speeding over seas and mountains, across frozen steppes or burning plains, on his errand. Pestilence or battle or death may lie on his path. The Jesuits' obedience is not less prompt. Selecting one, the general sends him to the royal cabinet. Making choice of another, he opens to him the door of parliament. A third, he enrolls in a political club. A fourth, he places in the pulpit of a church whose creed he professes that he may betray it. A fifth, he commands to mingle in the saloons of the literati. A sixth, he sends to act his, uh, to act his part in the evangelical conference. A seventh, he seats behind, uh, beside the domestic hearth. And an eighth, he sends afar off to barbarous tribes where, speaking a strange tongue, and wearing a rough garment, he executes amidst hardships and perils the will of his superior. Unquote. That is a monolithic conspiracy. Where the Jesuit priests submit every thought and every will to the whim of the Jesuit general and respond without thinking, without moral uh, scruple, without a moment's hesitation, and do precisely what the Jesuit general requests, taking no part in his conscience like a cadaver, moved about from place to place, like a stick in the hand of an old man. The general is the society. That is a monolithic conspiracy. The oxymoron fits, and it fits the Jesuits and no other institution on the planet. Indeed, exclaimed one Jesuit general, we have men glancing over the long roll of philosophers, orators, statesmen, scholars, and lawyers ready to serve him in a moment's notice in the state and in the church. 
in the camp or in the school, at home and abroad. We have men for martyrdom if they be required. Unquote. Therefore, warns J.A. Wiley, quote, We cannot be too much on our guard for the whole society of Jesuitism being founded on a law of unhesitating obedience can bring its force on any given point with unerring and fatal accuracy, unquote. British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli appears to have been alert to this fact when on September 20th, 1873, he told an audience at Aylesbury, quote, I can assure you, gentlemen, that those who govern must count with new elements. We have to deal not with emperors and cabinets only. We must also into consider, uh, take into consideration secret societies who have agents everywhere, determined men, encouraging assassinations, and capable of bringing about a massacre at any moment, unquote. Who was he thinking of but the Jesuit order and their subordinate societies like Freemasonry? He continues, he says, The Jesuit, says Wiley, have a most solemn form of consecration when preparing to commit their regicides, that is, the killing of kings. Quote, Bathing the sword with which the deed is to be done with holy water, they put it into his hand and pronounced the following exorcism. Quote, Come ye cherubims, ye seraphims, thrones and powers, Come, ye holy angels, and fill up this blessed vessel with an immortal glory, to, fill the ty to kill the tyrant and heretic, to give his crown to a Catholic king. Comfort the heart of him we have consecrated to this office. Strengthen his arm, that he may execute his enterprise." Unquote. Now, isn't that something? Nunc hoc a liquid is Latin, and it says, to quote St. Jerome, it says, Napoleon Bonaparte said, quote, The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign, over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work, if committed for the interest of the Society of Jesus or by the order of its general." Unquote. For having been trained like Pavlov's dogs, the Jesuits are conditioned to wait eagerly on the word of their general, salivating at his every command. Prompt and blind obedience is expected of every Jesuit, quote, without excuses and murmurings. They should try to maintain true abnegation of their own wills and judgment, unquote. That's from their own constitutions, part 6, chapter 1. Daniello Bartoli, the noted Jesuit historian and rector of the Jesuit College at Rome, writing in defense of Jesuitism, expresses this Jesuit vow, thus, quote, I should regard myself as a dead body, without will or intelligence, as a little crucifix which is turned about unhesitatingly at the will of him who holds it, as a staff in the hands of an old man who uses it as he requires it and as it suits him best, unquote. Now, I'd like to stop and ask my Catholic critic, who emails me from time to time, pointing out errors, so-called errors, who challenged me that the Jesuit oath is a fiction. Here we have a quote from a Jesuit historian literally quoting that oath. He did it in writing using the very words from that Jesuit oath that you claim is a fiction, a hateful fiction. 
How do you answer that? What other lie would you tell me to dissuade me from the belief that that diabolical oath is indeed the oath practiced by the Jesuits, not only practiced as revealed in history and current events, but that is even quoted by a Jesuit historian, Daniello Bartoli. I would ask you, my Catholic critic, Will you still email me and tell me that that Jesuit oath is a hoax, a hateful hoax to discredit the Roman Catholic Church? Or will you do like most Catholics do and just simply change the subject? Now, continuing with the book, it says, Consider this statement from paragraph 273 of the French edition of the Jesuit Constitutions, translated from the edition written by their first Jesuit general, Ignatius Loyola, quote, As far as possible, we should all think alike and speak alike, and differing doctrines ought not to be permitted, either orally or in books, or in books all books published must be approved by the superior. In regarding to things which are to be done, diversity should be avoided as far as possible, unquote. Thus the pious wretch, Ignatius Loyola, in the words of Thomas Carlyle, has, quote, done more mischief in the earth than any man born since, who reduced millions of brothers to spiritual mummyhood, unquote, of unhesitating obedience, adds the author. I quote from Regulae Societis Jesu, that is, the Regulations of the Society of Jesus, Volume 2, 1827, Paragraph 204, quote, Superiors must report to the provincial about persons and things, not only those inside the society, but also about what is done by us with others, successes and failures, and the provincial must know everything as if he was there, unquote. Thus we see that a Jesuit's private vocation is to travel the world like a spy and report back to his superiors, while his official mission is to preach peace and the care of souls. But if required of him, in the interest of his church and his order, to instigate war. Indeed, the Jesuit is always speculating on the vocations for martyrdom, always prepared to play the part of, even to die, as a victorious martyr. Today, the Society of Jesus, the largest order in the Roman Catholic Church, operates in 112 nations on six continents, all of which operations are under the discreet eye of the general. And it is said of them, and I won't butcher the Latin phrase, it's, it's, it's translated, they do just as they are ordered. Not even the Pope can rein them in, for we must not forget that Count Enrico de Campello, a close friend of Pope Pius IX, said, quote, There is a circle drawn by the Jesuits around the Pope, within which he, that is the Pope, is free to act. But if he crosses it, he's a dead man. Unquote. And history is copious with examples of popes that have been assassinated by the Vatican assassins, the Jesuit order, for stepping beyond that circle. Now we're going to continue. Chapter 13 of the book it is entitled, Crack Troops, the Training of a Jesuit. There, it begins with a quote. Give me the child until he is seven, and I will give you the man, unquote. Ignatius Loyola created, quote, an army to conquer the world, unquote. Secured in the knowledge, says J.A. Wiley, that by making each member, before enrolling himself, pass through an ordeal that should sift and try and harden him, we would he would serve the order to his utmost, Loyola himself was a soldier in the Spanish army, and he instilled the same principles and hardness in his sons, capital S, speaking of the Jesuits. 
As every army or military organization must have weapons and an arsenal, so too the army of Loyola. And the Jesuit general is the Aladdin that opens and shuts the box that holds the Jesuit genii. And he has apprentices who go wherever he may send them. Doubt it not. It has been said that the armies of Alexander were known for their courage and, dis and discipline. The men of Hannibal and the soldiers of Napoleon for their special preparations that gave them success on the battlefield. But, quote, the drilling and the discipline of all these combined cannot, in point of stern, rigid, and protracted severity, for a moment, be compared to the drilling and discipline which fitted and molded men for becoming full members in the militant institute of the Society of Jesus the Jesuits, unquote. They are the Pope's light cavalry, the sharpest weapon in the papal drawer, a body of priests living under martial law and discipline. The individual Jesuit, although he must have first trained as a priest, need not remain in active clerical duties. Indeed, many are sent out into the field to train and work as lawyers, doctors, teachers, journalists, and any other vocation that is deemed to be useful to the aims of the Jesuit order. But no one can be enrolled in the Society of Jesus until he has undergone a severe and long-continued course of training. Every Jesuit is a chosen man. In addition, certain candidates are picked from the cream of the order to ascend to the highest ranks according to their ability in promoting the designs and aims of the order. Said Philip Miller, an expert on the Jesuits, quote, Never before in the course of the world's history had such a society appeared. The old Roman Senate itself did not lay schemes for world dom uh, domination with greater certainty of success, unquote. To this observation, Philip Miller must be appended the explanatory statement of General Montalon, who served with Napoleon, quote, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. The aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world, and I'll finish the quote, by the volition of a single man, unquote. That's a global... Jesuit-controlled, monolithic kingdom. Control of the world by the volition of a single man. That's the New World Order. In case you think we overstate the case concerning the Jesuits, Wiley wrote, quote, an army to conquer the world, Loyola was forming. The general is the society. The general is the society. He could enkindle them with fanaticism and so pervert and indurate their souls by evil maxims and long and rigorous training that they should be insensible to shame and pain and would welcome suffering and death. Such were the weapons of the men he sought forth to the battle. Unquote. Not only are they made to endure a severe physical discipline, but as Philip Miller writes, quote, to a far greater extent than any other religious brotherhood, the Society of Jesus has endeavored ever since its foundation to come to terms with all the expressions of human mind, with theology as well as with natural science, with philosophy, art, politics, economics, constitutional law and jurisprudence, unquote. Quoting further, it says, But perfection in Jesuitism cannot be reached otherwise than by the loss of manhood, will, judgment, conscience, liberty, all the Jesuits lay down at the feet of his general. It is a tremendous sacrifice, but to him... The general is God, unquote. In the words of one of the society's eminent superior generals of the 17th century, quote, 
The members of the society are dispersed in every corner of the world, having the same aim, same conduct, same vow, and that the least sign of one man, the general, turns and returns the entire society, unquote. It is said that it is not possible for any, quote, who have been initiated into it, that is, the higher degrees of Jesuitism, to think of retiring from the order, since the congregation, through their excellent management of its machinery, know how to procure the immediate death of any such initiated member who may wish to leave their ranks, unquote. These bipolar men are so accustomed to dissembling and equivocation that even their conduct uh, toward each other is one of continuous act of deceit and spying. They swear to reveal to their superior what they have done, thought, read, learnt, and discovered, and to observe and to watch all that comes under their notice. That's from paragraph 204 of their regulations. Yet in all this, they are taught to be careful always to speak in the character of the pious devotees, holy men. What a brood of pious frauds. And if Jesus were here, he would use the familiar phrase, den of thieves, den of serpents, den of vipers. Let us now glance at the several grades of this great army of Loyola and the preparation, the preparatory discipline required in each case. We're going to talk about the separate degrees. And preface to this, I want to describe it as a Masonic order. Degrees of progression by which each degree is isolated from all others. We like to call it compartmentalization, so that the lower ranks are deceived about what the upper echelon is really all about. That is the success of all the secret societies. They're all created under that model of compartmentalization so that any defection at the lower ranks won't betray the real purpose and the real power of the society. That goes not only for the Jesuits, but Freemasonry. But for this study, we'll stick with the Jesuits, and we'll have to do that tomorrow because I see we've run out of time. Thanks for coming today. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.